Hello, today we are looking at testing God's guidance in our guidance series. The scripture for today comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 6 through 14, which reads, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So we know that we can seek, we can receive, and we can trust in God's guidance, and we can check our understanding through his faithful guide, because he's there when we do go to that guide, the Bible. He's there to instruct us. Yet even when we know that we are seeking and receiving God's guidance, many of us may not have the confidence or the clarity to trust his guidance and to believe that God will provide us with all that we need. So I liken this to putting something together and trying to read an instruction manual. Sometimes the instructions may not be so clear, other times they are. And the process itself may easily be understood, but can be confusing and frustrating to those who don't know what they're doing. And there are probably more parts and steps than we anticipated or imagined, and so it seems so much more complicated than we thought that it would be. But once we use those instructions, at the end of those instructions, you find yourself with a finished product. You got what you wanted, and you could not see the end product originally through the maze of steps and instructions. It's a process. And the guidance of God can be like that for the believer. God's will can be a confusing element in the life of a believer, especially for those who are not fully in touch with God or who are not seeking to live as God has called. So you may be asking, well, how can we respond to God, God's guidance with obedience to his will? And I think today's scripture reveals three ways that we can do it. First, we can walk in the light that we already have. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, it says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I really like that scripture. We need to walk as children of light. And it's important to remember that each and every one of us has been exposed to the darkness of sin. But because of who we are in Christ and where he has brought us from, he's brought us out of our darkness, it's imperative and very important for us as Christians to live in the light of Christ. We need to recognize that we do not have all the answers, but we are committed to the one who does. And if we do not trust that Jesus has all the answers for our lives, then we are leaving our lives open for deception from the enemy, distraction from him, temptations from him in the world. So walking in the light can only happen when we step out on faith and and begin to actually put into practice what God is calling us to do. And so walking in the light doesn't mean that we will always fully understand what God is doing. We we may not, and that's what faith is. It's trusting even if we're not sure what's going on. So I like this idea of walking as a child of God walking in the light because I think we need to approach it like a child does who's learning how to walk. I think we've all seen a small child, whether it's your own children, a niece or nephew, your grandchildren, 
that's beginning to get mobile and they're walking everywhere. They refuse to sit still. They want to go here. They want to go there. They may be bouncing all over the place. And sometimes in that learning how to walk, they fall and they may hurt themselves or not really hurt themselves, but cry because of frustration or, you know, they fell on their little bum. But in a few moments, they are back on their feet and they are walking again. You know, and part of it, I think, is they trust, they trust that hands will be there to guide them or hands will be there to catch them. And that's really what our walk with Christ is. He is there. He's there right alongside us. He's guiding us. He will catch us. He's, he's something that we can trust in. And he, he wants obedience. He wants us to walk in the light. He's not asking us to be perfect. He just wants us to be obedient, to keep trying and keep walking in the light. I know that he understands that we are going to stumble. We're going to fumble around in our journey. And I think that scripture, it, it reveals that when we are walking and if we're stumbling or we behave poorly or we make a mistake, it's going to help us grow. It's going to help us become more stable in our walk with Christ. So not only do I see that Christians must walk in the light, they, the light that they already have in Christ, as that scripture says, but also from that scripture, I see that we must test in order to approve what is acceptable to the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The word discern is often translated into test. So Here's a question out there. How many of you remember your school days, or if you're a teacher like I was, uh, that four-letter word, test? <laughs> well, I know that I didn't really understand the purpose of a test until I necessarily was older and was a teacher. The purpose of that test is to aid both the student and the teacher in the learning process. It helps to see what's been learned by the student and then teachers can reassess or reteach or, or help them out where they're missing things. And a student also knows their weak points and that's a good thing. The purpose of a test to, to learn and, and find out, gosh, I know this, but I need some work here is important in our lives. But tests are stress creators for most people and school, well, it's not the only place where we find them. Before a, a company can put a product out into the market, well, they test it. They try and get all the bugs out of it, and they try to prove that it's going to do what it's going to do or supposed to do, and, and it's tested. So like a test in school for students or testing of machinery or a product prior to putting it out in the marketplace, the believer, we, are also subjected to the testing process, and this is for the purpose of showing ourselves acceptable to God. So here's how this form of testing works. The more we are tested, the more we look to God for guidance. And the more we look for guidance, the more we rely upon him. The more we rely upon him, the more experience we get in discovering that he is going to be there for us. He's going to deliver us. And the more that we rely on him, the more we please him. And since we are constantly being tested, what we have to do is learn to rely on all the devices that can help us perform better, to test better. And those are things like reading his word, um, being in prayer, fellowship, devotionals, worships, sermons, being a part of your church, and missions. And I don't know about you, but I, I find it very comforting knowing that the God of the universe desires to comfort me, to strengthen me, and be there to guide me in my daily walk, my daily walk with him. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, the Apostle Paul said, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That scripture tells us very plainly that God is on our side. He is there for us. So in addition to the, the word of God and the Holy Spirit, 
I can see at least four other testing devices that God will use to test our walk and make us approved in his sight. One of them is our conscience or the conscience. Our conscience is an inner voice God has given us to guide our thoughts, to guide our desires, to guide our our choices every day. It's like an inner computer that stores information and that information is what we have received about right and wrong. And so as we make our own decisions, our conscience will either affirm that the decision is what God wants us to do, or it will go against that decision. Tell us, no, don't go that way. I think the Bible reveals to us that the conscience cannot be trusted in and of itself, but it's a good starting point for us. Our conscience has been exposed to this fallen world, and we have, so our conscience has. So it can't be trusted. Titus Chapter 1, verse 15, it says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. So we're not pure. We're striving to be pure. And so sometimes we can say, boy, I I don't feel good about that. I don't feel good about that. And it makes us pause and, and look to the other devices that we'll get to to see what we're supposed to do. We can't trust our conscience by itself. But once we've been saved and the truth has been revealed to our hearts, and the truth we find by the indwelling and the witness of the Holy Spirit, we can know we're doing what God desires. And so if we are listening to the Holy Spirit and we are reading the Bible and, and worshiping and, and in fellowship and praying and doing all of those things, we'll be more in tune with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be that inner voice that we hear. And in Romans 9 verse 1, it says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is really going to place upon us that right or wrong and and point us to the right direction. But we really need to be in the Spirit. And not only do we have our Holy Spirit-led conscience, but we also have the counsel of other Christians. We're taught throughout God's Word to teach and to admonish each other as it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. We know we are not the highest authority on truth, but God is working in our lives, and we're here for each other to complete each other in love sharing our testimonies, going through a tough situation, or, or just being there to pray with someone or, or listening ear. Those are all important things to help us test God's guidance. Are we, are we hearing correctly? Our conscience and the counsel of other Christians, they are great. But one method of test preparation that we tend to overlook is the simplest in my mind. Well, our own brain. <laughs> The fact of the matter is that God has given each and every one of us a brain to use, and we call using this brain for God's purposes common sense, which may not be so common anymore. In Titus chapter 2, verse 12, we read that after we are saved, the Spirit of God comes to train us He trains the believer in many areas, but especially to deal with spiritual matters. Here's what it says. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. My goodness. So Paul wrote these, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago, and it's still relevant today that we need to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So what this means is that when you are saved, you have a renewed mind. 
and that renewed mind is blessed with common sense, self-control, uprightness, right? And I want to warn you that common sense can never be accepted as complete sense. And the reason for this is because God sometimes leads us down a path or in a direction that does not seem to be sensible to us. We may be saying, no, no, Lord, I don't want to do that. And when that happens in our lives, it's not only the believer, I should say, it is only the believer who is in touch with God's will, who is going to understand that they need to trust God for the right direction. I know I felt that when he told me to change my vocation, to go from teaching to preaching. At first, I, I didn't think that that was a very sensible thing to do. But here I am. I went through all these processes using the devices and, and wanting that confirmation to know that I was hearing God's call. And I heard him, and here I am. He laid that path out. Not easy, but it was a clear path. It was one that was easy for me to follow. So the last device that we can assist us or, or can assist us when we're being tested by God's guidance or testing out God's guidance in our lives is the circumstances of life. If we have a feeling about where God is leading us and the circumstances of our life will either begin to open the doors of opportunity or they reveal that God's closing doors to push us in another direction. I definitely experienced that. We have to understand that the circumstances, they can verify a direction that God is leading us in. But, However, we have to understand that circumstances alone will never reveal God's will for your life. Again, if we are in God's word, if we're praying every day, and if we're seeking the will of God and listening for God to speak to us, he will. He will speak to you. He will make sure that you are hearing him. We can't fully rely on the circumstances of life to guide our direction. And that's not the only thing that he's going to provide for us. So we need to understand that we shouldn't rely on circumstances alone. You need to know that it's okay for you to test God's guidance for your life, but your testing cannot be based on the fact that you don't trust it. Instead, it should be a test to make sure that you're hearing him correctly. You're, you're hearing that guidance from God correctly. We, we have our conscience. We have other Christians' counsel. We have our common sense. We, we have the circumstances of life, our, our lives as, as great tools that we can use to know the will of God in our lives. But... I, I want to warn you here too, these tools are not to be used unless you are in prayer and reading God's word on a daily basis. Because left to their own, then these tools will lead us down a path of our own desires. And that brings us to the third way to respond, taking to task the unfruitful works of darkness. In Ephesians 5.11, another scripture or part of our scripture for today, we read, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Now you know that I've been talking about the fruits of the Spirit. Joy and love and peace and kindness and patience and self-control, all of those things. So we we know what the fruit of the Spirit is. So we are to take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. We are, we are to expose them. So scripture is saying that we cannot allow the deeds of darkness to be sown in the fellowship of believers. And when we see it, we can't ignore it. We're to address it head on. Now, it's possible that we may do this by our words, and you may hear me say something or do something. Um, 
or, or, or use my words in that. That's my role as a pastor and, and the leaders in the, in the church have that um, as well. But more importantly, or it's more conceivable, I guess, that we would do this with our conduct and with our lifestyle. Some people may become uncomfortable by what we say and what we do, but I think that's God's way of reaching the hearts of those who are lost in the darkness of this world. Those who can't see the need for a savior, those who the stain of their sin in their lives or the ultimate destruction they're headed for. God, God is going to help us use our words and our actions to reach those people, those people who don't know him. I think the point I'm trying to make here, or I know the point I'm trying to make here, is that God's guidance is not offered to us so that we can live a sheltered life, a life that's free from contact with the dark. God's guidance is given to keep us out of the world of evil, to keep us out of the darkness, yet it is also there to show us how we are called to live in this dark world and become a great influence on those who God places in our path. I ask for you to test, test God's guidance to not only seek and receive and trust his will, you, you need to test it because, as I said earlier, the testing isn't testing God. It's, it's testing, are we hearing you correct, Lord? Are we hearing you? We want to say what it says in our scripture today to those people who are lost in the darkness. We are to walk in the light. We are to be approved by God, and we are to stay out of Ah, we are to be in the darkness, but the light in the darkness and, and not be part of the unfruitful works of the world. So we can say to people, awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Let us pray. Father, it is so hard to be in the world and not be of the world. We must be of you. We must be people of light. We must be as children, your children, walking in the light. We must be a beacon of hope to those who are in the darkness. Lord, help us to speak words of truth, to, to feel confident, to, to test that we're hearing you correctly so that we can wake people up from the dead and the dark, so they too can walk in the light of your Son, Jesus, in whom we pray. Amen.